the achievement gap widens, and then just the emotional cost of, you know, that child having a learning disability and not getting adequate support, like the emotional toll increases as well. For some kids, they get more anxious and, you know, are more stressed by school or might avoid school more. For other kids, they're going to be overwhelmed and acting out or refusing to do things. There are many brilliant young people in the world who experience the dichotomy of disability layered on top of their intelligence. What are the common misconceptions about twice-exceptional individuals? How do traditional models fall short when identifying the learning disabilities of our brightest kids? And why is early recognition so pivotal for twice-exceptional kids' futures? Dr. Danica Maddox, psychologist, parent coach, and owner of the Gifted Learning Lab, is here to delve deep into the intricacies of twice exceptionality from childhood to adulthood. That's straight ahead on episode 193. I'm Emily Kircher Morris, and this is the Neurodiversity Podcast. What is neurodiversity? You see the world differently. Autism spectrum. Gifted. Complexities that are inherently inside. ADHD. Dysgraphia. Tourette's. All brains are different. You are exactly what this world needs. This is the Neurodiversity Podcast. If you're looking for more information about how to support twice exceptional learners, you should check out our virtual course, Strategies for Supporting Twice Exceptional Students. There are six modules addressing everything from social and emotional needs to executive functioning. You can choose to take a single module or the entire course. And while the course was created for educators, parents have also told us that they're learning a ton about how to support their children and advocate for them in ways that are more likely to get the support that they need. You can visit neurodiversity.university to see all the options. My conversation with Dr. Danica Maddox is up next. Previously on the Neurodiversity Podcast. Hello, my name is Harry Thompson, and I am the author of The PDA Paradox. What is pathological demand avoidance? They will exhibit differences in communication, social interaction, and also uh, restricted and repetitive behaviors and interests. PDA is best understood, according to the literature, as an anxiety-driven need to remain in control. And I tell people, try not to get too hung up on the demand avoidance aspect, because then it will make understanding how the child's presentation can differ in school more difficult uh, to grasp. That's episode 54. Look for it wherever you get your podcasts. Today, I'm welcoming Dr. Danica Maddox to the podcast. Danica is a psychologist, parent coach, and owner of the Gifted Learning Lab. Danica, thank you so much for talking to me today. Thanks for having me here. I'm really excited to be here. We're going to be talking about twice exceptionality. Um, For those who may not be familiar with the term, twice exceptionality refers to individuals who are both cognitively or intellectually gifted, but also have another learning disability, perhaps autism, ADHD, or something like dyslexia or dysgraphia. And so this is an area that you've done a lot of research in. And so I thought it would be great to start out by talking about some of the common misconceptions about twice exceptional people especially those with learning disabilities like dyslexia or dyscalculia or dysgraphia? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, the biggest misconception is just that they don't exist. You know, I think like just at the starting at the very basic, um, I remember in graduate school when I started um, researching twice exceptionality, when I would talk with other academics about it, you know, or other people, you know, it's like, oh, I'm studying um, kids who are gifted and have a learning disability. And people would say, is that really a thing, though? (laughs) You know, is that true? Like, do those kids exist? Mm -hmm. And then I think even for people who, you know, know that they exist or um, educators who may have, you know, they know that they're teaching kids who are twice exceptional, or even when parents know their kid is twice exceptional, I think a common misconception or misunderstanding is just to kind of have either the giftedness or the learning disability overshadow the other. And it's really hard to kind of keep both of those things in mind. You know, I think it's easy to focus on one at a time, but to remember that um, they're kind of both a part of the kids at all times. So I think if there's a twice exceptional kid whose giftedness really shines through and who's maybe academically talented in a lot of areas, 
you know, a kid with dyslexia could even be like an, uh, you know, a strong reader sometimes. And so it, their challenges and kind of the effort they put into their work could really be lost or misunderstood. Um, whereas if there's a gifted kid whose learning disability can, is pretty, um, you know, affects their schoolwork a lot, or if for them it's so frustrating that it leads to big meltdowns about homework or refusing to write or things like that, I think that can kind of take center stage in people's mind. And a lot of times then the giftedness or the talent might be um, neglected or just forgotten or not get as much attention because um, they're noticing the struggles more often. So it's kind of a misconception, but I think it's more about, you know, at some level, these people, they know the kid is both gifted and um, has a learning disability, but it's just hard to keep both those things in mind and to remember to give equal attention to both. Yeah, definitely. I I find that So many kids who struggle in this area, they do compensate, they mask. And if we notice it, it might look like ADHD or just a difficulty with regulating emotions because it's that frustration. And it's confusing because specifically with dyslexia, quite often what happens is children especially have a wide range of background knowledge. Right. And so when they're reading, it appears that they're comprehending and they are comprehending because maybe they can make really good inferences about what they're reading, even if they're missing some of the words. And it's not until they get older that all of a sudden that comes to the surface. Yeah, absolutely. I think that under the idea of compensation and masking is critical to understand a twice exceptional person right? That um, because of their capabilities and intelligence, like you said, they may have a huge vocabulary and, you know, they may be, um, have a ton of information and knowledge, be able to anticipate like how a sentence is structured, what kind of word is going to come next, you know, and they can make do pretty well, you know, understanding what they're reading. But it's true. It's, it's usually more when things get more complex or when they're required to read a lot more at a time, you know, and co- read more quickly that they can start to feel overwhelmed and then it becomes more apparent that they could use accommodations like listening to an audiobook or having extra time for things. Um, there's a reason I think that like I'm, I do not blame parents or teachers for missing these things sometimes, you know, because it just it doesn't look the same as what you're expecting. And it can be really easily hidden because these kids are just kind of doing the best that they can with the strategies and information they have. So it often looks different. And probably they just don't have very good insight into why it's hard. They just know that it doesn't match. It's not yes. coming together. Maybe they're comparing themselves to their peers or they're not getting the grades that they think they should. And so then it's hard for them to self-advocate because of that. Absolutely. Yeah. And a lot of you know gifted kids who have a learning disability, their achievement scores, like on a standardized test, for example, could be average, right? So they may even see themselves as you know, doing just fine for their grade level and other people see that they're at the kind of expected level for their age, but there can still be this discrepancy between what they can comprehend, you know, and sort of their intellectual functioning overall and then what academically they're doing. Um, I'd say in my experience too, some gifted kids with learning disabilities like are able to compensate and are so motivated to do well in school and to make a good impression and to kind of do things as well as they can, that they still excel academically. They're just taking a lot more time, you know, or putting a lot more effort into it. Um, And so they just see, sometimes they just see that they, they know they work hard, you know, and they may not even think that they're that smart. They just think they're a really hard worker and that that's why they do well, Um, but that they're compensating through that hard work as well. So your research is actually some that I cite quite often when I do presentations and work with educators because I find it so fascinating how you looked at how we identify twice exceptional learners with learning disabilities specifically. And some of your research showed that the way that we commonly identify learning disabilities, which is through what we call the discrepancy model, is kind of one of the formats that we'll use. And um, where we compare a child's ability to their achievement level isn't necessarily the best way to identify learning disabilities in bright kids. Can you talk a little bit about that research and what you found? Yeah, absolutely. And just to give a little more information about the discrepancy model and kind of how it usually works is, you know, looking at 
um, for any kid, that looking for a discrepancy between their intellectual capacity, you know, their IQ or their verbal abilities, and then how they're performing academically. And the idea behind the discrepancy approach is that most kids should be able to perform academically at about the same level that their cognitive skills are at. So a kid who's got average cognitive ability should do about average in their academic skills. You know, and so this approach looks for kids who have a big gap, like maybe cognitively they're average, um, but they're really behind in reading or math. And that would signal something's getting in the way of their learning. Um, and so for gifted kids, when it's applied to gifted kids, it looks a little different because you would say, well, these kids are cognitively above the norm, like they're way above average, you know, they can um, understand and do things uh, more so or more easily than other kids their age. So if they're earning scores or if they're kind of, uh, yeah, usually in a standardized assessment, you know, earning an average score on reading or math or writing, that signals that maybe they have a learning disability um, because, you know, we know they're really bright. Shouldn't they be performing above average in these academic areas too? And so in my research, I looked at, I took a nationally um, representative set of data from, you know, assessments that are often used to assess kids and looked at what happens if you take that criteria, you know, if you say, okay, let's look at a kid's cognitive score and see how many of these kids earn a score that is, a, you know, one and a half standard deviations lower than their um, cognitive abilities. Like that's a big gap, you know, so that might be 22 and a half points between their um, IQ score and their reading score, for example. And the traditional discrepancy approach would say if they have a gap that big, they probably have a learning disability. But what I found in my research is that about 70% of gifted kids actually have a gap that big between their IQ or their very high verbal score in at least one area of achievement. So just statistically, because of the way statistics works, <laughs> there's a phenomenon called regression to the mean, right? When a, someone has a really high score in one area, it's just likely that they're not going to score that high in other areas. So it's really common for a kid with a really high cognitive score to have at least one area that is even, you know, 25 points lower, for example. And I think that's really helpful for parents to know and teachers and psychologists who are doing assessments to know that just because there's a big gap doesn't mean there's necessarily a learning disability and that that's actually really common for gifted kids. However, I also write in my research, we can't just stop there because there are definitely kids who are gifted and have learning disabilities and who, for whom a big gap is meaningful. And so in like a subsequent research study, I looked at kind of integrating the more modern um, approach, I would say, to learning disability assessment and best practices is, you know, the idea behind a learning disability is that the reason someone is having a hard time learning in a certain area is because of a difference in like a certain cognitive process. So they maybe they their processing speed is slow. Their brain just doesn't process information as quickly or it takes them longer to take information out of their long-term memory, for example. Or a lot of kids with a dys dyslexia have a hard time distinguishing different letter sounds or remembering the names of the letter sounds. And so the idea there is that you would look for a discrepancy but you'd also look for, you know, and assess for whether a kid has a difference in one of these basic processing capacities as well that indicates, oh, they probably, their brain is wired in a way that makes the traditional way of learning reading really hard, right? Or that makes it hard for them to um, remember their math facts and recall them from memory and um, things like that. So kind of combining that discrepancy approach with a more thorough assessment of what's going on for that kid and how their brain works. It's complicated. It's complicated. <laughs> well, and, and schools have such limited resources to even be able to assess. And so then when you have a child who looks like they're performing mostly in an average range overall, it's difficult to justify taking the time and the money to do those assessments. However, in a perfect world, if we could really see all of that, we could probably find some more of those kids before it gets to the point where it's causing even more problems in the classroom because as they get older and the content gets more difficult, that gap might widen. Right. The achievement gap widens and then just the emotional cost of, you know, that child having a learning disability and not getting adequate support, like the emotional toll 
increases as well. You know, either in, for some kids, they get more anxious and, you know, are more stressed by school or might avoid school more. For other kids, they're going to be overwhelmed and acting out or refusing to do things. Um, and you can just see what a negative toll it takes on those kids' well-being in school and with learning. A lot of states have had some new laws that are going into effect that really are talking about looking for some of these learning disabilities. I feel like perhaps there's some change. And one quick note, I feel like maybe that we should mention, sometimes in some states when I go and travel and and do trainings, teachers have been told that their school doesn't identify or support dyslexia or dyscalculia. And I think it's important to realize that those are just terms that we use in the medical or the psychological world. And the terms that we use in the school are specific learning disability in reading fluency, in math comprehension, whatever that might be. And that's due to the disability laws, IDEA, and the 13 categories that they allow for special education services in the schools. But ultimately, schools are assessing for those things. It's not some totally unique assessment that has to take place for them to identify those things. I've heard that as well when I was doing training in Texas, that, you know, we don't we don't assess for and we don't provide intervention for those things. Although things I would say also the conceptualization of that can vary so much from district to district and state to state, too. Um, One thing that is tricky is a lot of schools just don't either don't have access to or don't use the same types of measures you would get in a private assessment. Mm. So they may not look at the underlying cognitive processes that would indicate dyslexia. You know, and if they just do certain measures, gifted kids, there's research that shows, you know, gifted kids could have dyslexia, but their processing speed and their working memory might still look average, you know, or kind of fine on certain assessments. And that you really need sometimes a more detailed assessment of their ability to pull information from memory, you know, or things like that, that the school just simply may not provide. And so that can be a tricky part of like school-based assessments is a, a lot of Um, parents that I work with do end up going and seeking out private assessments um, because the school doesn't offer a complete enough assessment. And some states don't allow assessments. They require identification of learning disabilities through response to intervention, right, which essentially requires that kids, you know, the idea that like everyone gets high quality instruction. And if a kid doesn't learn, they get a little more individualized instruction And if they're, you know, in a smaller group and if they're still not learning with one on one instruction, then they might get referred for an assessment. But the problem with that for gifted kids is most gifted kids seem to make adequate progress because even if they have a learning disability, they can often do grade level work just with extra effort and maybe a little extra instruction. So there is a lot of concern that that response to intervention or RTI process really hides and misses um, twice exceptional kids you know, until much later when things get harder or that they might not be identified until college or, you know, even a lot of parents I work with realize, hey, maybe I have dysgraphia, you know, or maybe I'm dyslexic. Um, But now that I see that my kid is, you know, I struggled with these things too, but we're never identified. That reflection as adults is really um, different. And and actually, that kind of brings me to the next thing I wanted to ask you, which is um, about how your perspective on intelligence and giftedness and twice exceptionality and neurodivergence has changed throughout your career. Are there certain preconceptions or ideas that you had before you entered the field that now have changed over time? I've been, I think I'm a little different than some other folks who specialize in giftedness. Um, and I don't know how you came to this, but I think a lot of people, when they learn their kids are gifted or twice exceptional, they get really interested in this topic. And it's something that I've been interested ever since I was identified as gifted as a child when I was seven. So I really came into the topic um, kind of through my own personal experiences and looking at myself and my brother growing up, you know, who's also gifted. And um, that was sort of the framework that I used to understand us and our experience in the world. And I think I was very aware of giftedness um, and was always drawn to in my career as a teacher and a therapist to really bright kids who had a hard time in some way, you know, who were overwhelmed or who didn't like school or, um, you know, seemed misunderstood. 
But I always, for a long time, just was not aware of twice exceptionality much at all. And I would say even when I started researching it in grad school, it was like, okay, that's this small little proportion of kids that we should really identify. And the more work I do and the more families I work with, I just see twice exceptionality and neurodivergence everywhere. You know, and recently was even like, wait, I think I'm twice exceptional. And it didn't even occur to me for years while studying this that I could be. And so I I think my mind has just been expanded to see um, neurodivergence. I just think there's so much masking that goes on for gifted folks, that gifted folks who have learning disabilities, but also who are autistic or, you know, who are ADHDers, just fly under the radar and get seen as like, well, you're just a quirky, gifted kid, or, you know, you're so bright, so we just ignore all those other things that are hard for you. <laughs> um, so I, I think my... I've become much more curious about being neurodiversity affirming in this really broad way, you know, not just in terms of um, the giftedness and the need for challenge and, you know, the need for learning at your level, which is kind of what I was most passionate about early on, I think. Um, and I guess I'll say too, like with twice exceptionality, when I first started researching it and in the research field right now, as far as I know, it's very siloed, like the different exceptionalities are seen as like distinct bodies of research. So there's research on kids who are gifted with a learning disability. There's research on kids who are gifted with ADHD. And there's research on kids who are gifted and autistic. But there's so much overlap between learning disabilities, ADHD, and autism. So many gifted kids with a learning disability are also autistic or also have ADHD. And it's so important to see all those aspects of someone's identity and how their brain works in order to support them well. So I think that's something that my perspective has really changed over time. I feel like a lot of us in the field have seen that gradual shift in understanding. And you're right. I think so many kids our age, once you got that gifted label, there wasn't really anything else that was explored. So if somebody was struggling, it was that they were lazy or they were unmotivated or if they were having trouble with friendships, it was that they're just kind of quirky or they, you know, they like to be on their own. And now as we're realizing, yeah, it can be a lot of different things and being proactive and, and working to identify and understand and support all of those pieces is really so important because Late diagnosed adults who are realizing these things about themselves have a lot of emotion yeah. about their experiences and how they weren't supported and what they learned about themselves. And it's hard to undo that as an adult. Absolutely. And I think a lot of parents with gifted kids can feel afraid of the twice exceptionality label, you know, or like worried. You know, we, we live in just such an ableist society where like, you know, not everyone thinks gifted as being you know, being gifted is a good thing. Like there's a lot of anti-intellectualism and stuff also. I'm not saying that gifted is this, you know, wonderful label in everyone's experience, but it is this sort of saying like, well, you're very talented. This kid is very talented and very good at this. And I think there's still such stigma around ADHD and autism and learning disabilities that parents can feel afraid to find that out about their kid. But I really see that you know, discovering twice exceptionality can be this like path to kind of understanding and liberation because without that label and kind of knowing that, you know, neurotype, it, you're right. There's so many negative stories, not only for the kids themselves who start to worry, like, am I just lazy? You know, or like, am I, you know, a lot of the kids I talk, it's like they worry, like, am I actually a bad person inside because I am supposed to feel this way, but I actually feel this way. Or I'm supposed to like these things, but I I don't like those things, you know. Um, you know, or they get they see themselves as troublemakers, or they can't get along in the system. You know, there's so many negative identities that kids can develop. And when I talk with parents, you know, they hate that they worry those things about their kid too. You know, they're like, "Is my kid? Do they not have empathy? Or do they? Um, are they just careless and you know unmotivated?" And it's all these negative stories that are just often like a misunderstanding of just a brain difference, right? That is not inherently bad at all. It's just a, way, a different way of operating. Um, so I do think understanding that early on can be actually really liberating. And it, if adults learn that about themselves, I think it can be a way of, you know, it offers us kind of um, 
a framework for understanding yourself more compassionately. And in my parent coaching program, when I work with parents, we always talk about, well, what's the compassionate story about this thing that you're concerned about? Like, mm. how, what's the compassionate story about what's going on with your kid when that's happening? And trying to develop an understanding from that compassionate lens. And it often has to do with recognizing which things are just, you know, hard for a kid or which systems just are not a good fit, you know, with how the way their brain works and trying to see them in a positive light. Um, and it can be so healing for parents, too, if they have those same characteristics that were misunderstood when they were younger. And, you know, they start to kind of reparent themselves by accepting those things in their kids. And um, it's just very powerful. I really love that term that you're using, compassionate storytelling. And I'm, I'm wondering, just from a clinical side of things, I'm curious, would that be kind of like a narrative therapy type of intervention? Or would you say that that fits maybe somewhere else? That's a great question. I, in my training, I wasn't trained in narrative therapy. I know, I know a little bit about it. Mm -hmm. The way I think about it, like in my work with parents and the parent coaching program I do, we start with trying to under just really trying to understand our you know each parent's kid like helping them understand their kids and then try to like just understand where your kid is coming from and to kind of trust that they're doing the best that they can so in my mind you know we talk so much about how to like validate your kid's perspective validate their intense emotions and kind of align with them so for me, in my mind, it's all tied up with this idea of needing to see it from the kid's perspective to be able to help the kid know, like, it's okay to feel that way. And of course, and it makes sense that you feel that way, or I see it in a compassionate way. It's not so much storytelling as like trying, or at least in my mind, I guess the way my mind works is thinking about like trying to help the parents just have their kid make sense to them in a way that is also compassionate and that helps them soften, you know, towards these tough moments in parenting and see their kids in the best light. So if we were to suggest to our audience, maybe they're struggling with their kid or something, you know, what would be like a prompt or something that you would say to help people reflect on that either for themselves or for their child? That's a great question. <laughs> um in my parent coaching program, I try to help parents understand where different intense behaviors come from. So one example is, um, or a couple common things for gifted and twice exceptional kids. A lot of parents will say like uh, daily routines feel like a nightmare in our house or they're so stressful. You know, my kids are resisting them. So one example, you know, there's a mom whose teen just would not brush his teeth without an argument. You know, he was a teenager. It was like, come on, like this, should, you know, this should be simple. You're a bright kid. <laughs> you know, can you please brush your teeth? Um, and in order to have a compassionate story about what's going on, we just talk about like all the different components involved in something like brushing your teeth, right? So it's like, well, that requires executive functioning to be able to say, I'm going to stop doing what I'm doing that I'm, you know, maybe I'm playing video games and that's really fun. And now it's time to go brush my teeth. That requires like stopping and pulling yourself away from something interesting to go do something pretty unappealing or uninteresting, you know, and that for a lot of parents and kids, these daily struggles are because they're actually hard for the kids to do. You know, it's actually a difficult task to pull yourself away from something fun and go do something less interesting to have compassion for how difficult that can be. Um, and then sensory sensitivities come up a lot. You know, for this kid, brushing his teeth was really physically uncomfortable. Um, it was hard to do. He didn't feel coordinated enough to do it on one. You know, that's another thing. And then just the physical sensation of the bristles and the taste and it felt painful. You know, so brushing teeth was not a simple task for him. It was quite unpleasant. And to be able to see that from a compassionate lens and I would say this kid hadn't shared that much of that information with his parent either, you know, and so sometimes as a parent, just being curious about that, maybe there's a compassionate story underneath here that I don't even know about because my kid hasn't shared it yet. You know, so it might be like, what makes this so hard? What, what is so tough about brushing teeth? So this parent I worked with, she asked her kid, you know, what's so hard about this? Like, why is this so difficult? And he shared how uncomfortable it was and that he felt like he couldn't do it well, like he wasn't coordinated. And she offered, you know, I could help you brush your teeth if you'd like. And he was like, that would be great. <laughs> and I was, you know, I said to the parent, what an amazing moment of trust, like for your kid to let you help, you know, and she did it very gently and it wasn't as uncomfortable for him. 
Um, and I think over time, as they worked together, they bought a new toothbrush, you know, they tried different toothpaste and tried to find a more pleasant sensory experience too. And he went back to brushing his own teeth. But just this, you know, being able to approach with curiosity and compassion. Um, whereas I think when that mom came in, it was like, it's just, you know, he's just resisting it. He's just being difficult. He's not wanting to help out with a routine or, you know, she wasn't really sure what it was. Uh, it seemed frustrating. So sometimes understanding, I think, what's hard. A lot of these kids, like if it's like this needing to trust our kids that if they're not doing something or something, you know, feels difficult, it's often not because they want to be difficult. <laughs> you know, there's often something that makes it really unpleasant for them or that actually makes it hard. So trying to find that compassionate story about what's making it hard for them and then working together as a team to make it less tricky, you know, or to make it more appealing in some way. Removing the power struggle. For sure. I have a whole mini course. I have a whole free email mini course about reducing power struggles. <laughs> it's such a common concern. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll put that link in the show notes. People might really appreciate accessing that. As we wrap up our conversation, um, I know we could sit here and talk about this all day, but if you were talking to a parent or a teacher in general who's trying to support and understand a 2E child beyond the self-compassion that we just talked about, is there something that you feel like is the most important thing for them to hear? What is it that you would really want them to know so that they could support those kids in the best way possible? I think what I talk about a lot in my work with parents is um, permission to do things differently and feeling permission to um, go against the traditional way of parenting. And I would say the same thing for teachers. You know, I think parents and teachers have so much pressure on them um, you know, this idea that there's a right way to parent. If you're not setting boundaries and, you know, being really firm with consequences, that, you know, this idea that um, you're doing parenting wrong or you're not, you're doing teaching wrong. And for a lot of twice exceptional kids, you know, they need something different than the traditional approach. And what they need is often counterintuitive or almost the opposite of what you may have been trained to do. <laughs> you know, they often need flexibility. They need more control and autonomy. Um, you know, they need to lean into their interests. Uh, you know, there's all these things that kind of this idea of like giving up on something you said you have to do it this way and then being flexible with them and letting them do it their own way or convince you of something else. That that's actually awesome parenting and awesome teaching for those kids. You know, and a lot of times it's just giving parents and teachers that permission um, to feel good about doing things in a different way instead of worrying that they're um, cheating in some way or like, you know, doing it wrong that they're actually meeting their kid. It's, that's very neurodiversity affirming to meet the kid where they're at, to work together, to make something accessible for them. Dr. Danica Maddox of the Gifted Learning Lab. Thanks for chatting with me today. Thanks, Emily. It's a pleasure. The way we recognize, understand, and support twice exceptional learners has to stem from neurodiversity affirming practices. 2E kids are multiply neurodivergent and in a way that frequently prevents them from getting the right supports. Either they aren't struggling enough or they aren't succeeding enough. It can be a no-win situation. When we take the time to sort through those strengths and struggles, though, we can find ways to build their esteem in healthy ways that aren't built on fragile compensatory strategies that are only going to work temporarily and we can help them to build the skills they need for the long term. I'm Emily Kircher Morris. I'll see you next time on the Neurodiversity Podcast. You can learn more about Danica Maddox via the links in our show notes. Also, if you're interested in learning more about twice exceptionality, we have a course in the Neurodiversity University called Strategies for Supporting Twice Exceptional Students. It's great for teachers and is perfect to use for professional development or to take care of those continuing education requirements. It's good for parents, too, to help you understand the goals for educating our 2E kids. Our host is Emily Kircher Morris. Our office manager and social media director is Krista Brown. I'm the executive producer, Dave Morris. For all of us, thanks for listening, and we will see you next time.
This is a service of the Neurodiversity Alliance.